All right, I wanted to, um, I had talked about this for a couple weeks, and so I wanted to talk uh, tonight, and probably more than just tonight, on the subject of demons. Um, uh, not a, a fun subject to cover, but one of necessity, one we probably don't get to enough, one that I probably haven't taught enough. And so I thought we'd just uh, look tonight very specifically. I have a number of verses. I even, to be honest with you, I took my notes this afternoon and went through and, and looked up each one again and crossed some out to kind of narrow down what we would look at here tonight as far as um, what the Scripture has to say on the subject of demons. I, I think there's a, a, um, a two folds. One, there seems to be, I think we would agree, more than ever, especially in this new century, there seems to be an, an increase in the interest of things of mysticism, uh, good and bad, whether that's angels or demons, whether that's, um, you know, ghost or, um, you know, or, or whatever, or Satanism. Uh, you know, we see that being battled in our local school district here where they're trying to have a Satan club. And, and you know, there's that interest in all this stuff in the, uh, you know, something outside of our realm or outside of our understanding. And um, you know, the Bible has some very clear information on some of that. I think we would agree some of it we don't understand. We're not, we're not given information on. And so let's see what the Bible does have to say about some of this tonight. Um, along with this, we're going to talk a little bit about Satan, obviously, and a lot of the verses we look at may talk about both, and so we'll, we'll kind of see those intermingled. Let's start in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28. We're going to look at the origin of, of all of these things, Satan, demons. Um, we didn't look at yet. We will, if not probably tonight, next week. Uh, but we wrestle not flesh and blood, but we wrestle principalities and powers. So that's what we're talking about. What is this spiritual battle, this spiritual warfare? Uh, I think the questions that arise as we turn to Ezekiel 28, the questions that are, arise are things like, you know, what effect can demons have on the Christian? You know, can, can, can a Christian be possessed by demons? What is demon possession? Is that a real thing? You know, again, some of these things get um, hyped up or, or dramatized in movies with exorcisms and those type of things. But what does the Bible have to say about these things? I think the, the other side of that, and, and we have to be honest about, is as we get closer and closer to the day of the Lord, as our country goes further and further from God, we're going to see an increase in Satanism, demonism, uh, the, the spread of that, the effect of that, the embrace of that in our society. It's going to become more prevalent, not less. So we need to be versed on these things. Exodus 28 Starting in verse number 11, we have this unique passage, and uh, we would agree in, again, uh, what did I say, Ezekiel? It's Ezekiel. I think I just said Exodus. Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel. You got the right place. Ezekiel chapter 28, starting in verse 11, we have this unique passage, and uh, we're going to talk about here, uh, it's kind of a story laid out, talking about the fall of Satan, all right? So, Ezekiel 28, verse 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. That gives us some indication of who we're talking about, all right? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, Diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabarets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast, or used to be, upon the holy mountain of God. 
Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And that all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So this account is given this from the prophet Ezekiel to the prophet Ezekiel, that Ezekiel has recorded for us by the hand of God here in the book of Ezekiel. And do we have this account laid out? And it's, I think... Uh, it's very clear who this is talking about. Uh, and by that, I mean none of your commentaries. Not, nobody would debate that this is talking about Lucifer. This is the uh, uh, one who was established as an, an angel, almost for sure an archangel. Uh, it is believed, based on the entirety of Scripture, there were three archangels, Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. Lucifer is the one that was given these certain talents. In fact, it talked about the beauty there with all of the stones given as a covering in verse 13. And then it says that in verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. So this was the, a beautiful archangel that was given some authority. And then it tells us at the end of verse number 13, the workmanship of thy tabrets of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day. So it looks like the role that Lucifer, the angel, was given was music and may well have been the key angel to lead music in heaven up until his fall. Now let's look at one other passage that coordinates with this, Isaiah 14. So we'll go back a couple books. Isaiah chapter 14, one other One other, uh, one other passage here is going to talk about Lucifer. I, I cover a couple things here. As, um, as I was leaving this morning, uh, was Brother Joel Fitz and I were talking, and um, this morning I preached on this. Um, the prophet, as uh, Mary Joseph took the babe to the uh, temple, there in Jerusalem to be circumcised and so forth. forth. The, the prophet said, uh, here is the light to lighten the Gentiles. And then John in John chapter 1, covered about five or six verses there in John chapter 1, emphasized the fact that he is the light. Jesus Christ is the light. As I was leaving this morning, Brother Joel said to me, he said, he said I know you're talking about demons tonight. He said, Lucifer, what's, what's Lucifer mean? And I said, Son of the morning or star of the morning. I think that's what Lucifer means. And he said, um, well, if you read the root word, it also means light bearer. So I looked up. I studied this this afternoon. I looked this up this afternoon. And it says, as a noun, Lucifer, uh, um, uh, small l, not as a name, but as a word, Lucifer means star of the morning also means something like the planet Venus. But as an adjective, it means light bearer, which is what Brother Joel said. So Brother Joel's point was with the message this morning, Jesus Christ is the light. Satan comes pretending to be the light. He's the great deceiver. Jesus comes bearing light. Lucifer comes wanting you to think he's the light. 
thus Christ and Antichrist, thus God and Satan, right? The contrast between the two. All that to say, let's look at verse number 12. We'll see where I got my answer from, all right? Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Uh, we'll stop right there. I think we see right there, is it five times? In verse number 13, I will exalt, I will sit, I will ascend, I will be like the most high. I missed the first one in 13, I will ascend. Five times. Five times in verses 13 and 14, Lucifer says, I will. I will. Listen, I... Lucifer's problem was, was pride. I, 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 have, I have preached a whole message on this. I believe every sin is based on pride. Every sin. I think that's the foundation of sin is pride. It's pride that I take what I shouldn't take, that I envy over what someone else has, that I lust, that I desire, that I steal, that I kill, that I do whatever, it's pride. Pride is the root problem in sin. It was Satan's problem, Lucifer's problem. Lucifer the angel, I will do this, I will ascend, I will make myself. The, a passage in Ezekiel 28 tells us he was, uh, he was astounded by his own beauty. His own beauty tripped him up, and he thought of his own importance and who he was. So, I, again, this is uh, the theological part of what I'm talking about. We're going to talk about what the Bible says about uh, demons in a second here, but the foundation here. We're worried about demons and what they are and who they attack and what they're trying to do and what our caution needs to be with demons. Listen, the biggest thing we're going to have to look at is what, what is it that Satan, now that Lucifer has fallen, the Bible says his name is Satan. So Satan, that great deceiver, what is it he wants to do? How does he want to attack us? Whether it's him or his demons, what is his motive? What is his operation? What is his tactic? I think those are the things we're going to focus on in the next couple of weeks. The Bible uses these words to talk about demons. We'll see these as we look through some passages. Demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceitful spirits. And then, of course, in the one passage we're going to look at, refers to all of this as principalities and powers. One of the things that I'm going to caution us about as we go down through here, and I, I've, you've heard me say this before when we've talked about Satan. Um, I think one of the, uh, this is, uh, I'll do this as, a, as another night, and I've, I've done this in the past on another book, Warren Wearsby's book, The Strategy of Satan. Little book, powerful book. Tells you exactly how Satan tries to attack us. But here's one of the things I want to take out of that. Satan is very powerful. Satan absolutely wants our destruction. We should never minimize him. At the same time, let's not give Satan power that he doesn't have. You know what Satan can't do? Satan cannot read our minds. Now, that's very important because God can. When I pray, I can pray without audibly using my voice. We don't have to guess that that is a way that God hears us. We know that. In fact, if you want a biblical example, and I don't have time tonight, but read the story of Hannah praying for a child. Because her lips moved, no sound came out, 
the priest thought she was drunk. <laughs> but, but, but God answered her prayer. She prayed, God answered it. So we know that God hears our prayer even when we don't audibly speak out loud. Now, that, that's something you and I take for granted, right? I mean, that's not, you didn't come here tonight to learn that. We know that, right? You're going to go home tonight, tomorrow morning. You're going to have your devotions. You're probably going to read some scripture at some point this week. You're going to pray at some point this week. You'll probably pray sitting at, the, at your table or at your chair with a cup of coffee, and nobody will hear a word you say, but we know God hears it. That's extremely important and a confidence we have. But here's something, here's something we should look at as something to make prayer even more powerful. Satan can't hear it. He can't read our mind. He has no idea. Now, he's very perceptive, and he knows from the decisions we make. He knows the sin we fall into. I think, I think Satan not... I don't know if literally, but I think Satan's powerful enough. He has a log book on me, you know. He knows what will get me. He knows the things I fall into and I fall into the trap of and the temptation. Uh, the Bible tells us the sin that doth so easily beset me. I know what it is. God knows what it is. I think Satan knows what it is too. Why? Because he's seen it get me before. He knows what works. He knows it. And so he's able to pinpoint it and know my weakness and know my sin. So let's, let's give him the power that he has to know what's going on. And when I'm talking about the way he affects us, I'm talking about the demons too. Because, listen, here's one other thing Satan does not have. We talk about the attributes of God. God is all-powerful, all-knowing. God is omnipresent. You know who's not omnipresent? Satan's not omnipresent. He's not. We believe from everything we read in Scripture that Satan can only be in one place at one time. He's able to, to move quickly. You know, I think Satan could be in a, in, in, in a dozen places this next hour if he so wishes to. No doubt about it. But he can only be in one place at a time. He is not omnipresent. So when we say, and you know the old age-old thing that kids like to say, you know, did you take the cookie out of the cookie jar? Yeah, the devil made me do it, right? The devil made me do it. Well, probably, probably the devil didn't. It's great that we have access to the throne of God, and God hears my prayer, and nothing is too small or minute to bother God. He's not too busy for me. I'm not going to annoy him because my request isn't as, as, as important as everybody else's request. Here, I'm going to say this. Ready? I hear this all the time. I hear this as pastor all the time. Oh, I don't want to bother God. or I, I don't want to bother. At prayer meeting, I'm not going to mention my prayer request. It seems trivial to everything else that's mentioned. That by saying that, we are inadvertently limiting God. We're saying that, you know, God, God's, God's so busy, he shouldn't be bothered with my request. I understand maybe, maybe we don't want to bother other people with it, but we should never think we're bothering God with it. Because God is limitless in his power and his scope and his presence and his understanding. God is there. Satan is not. He's not everywhere. He doesn't, he can't be everywhere. He can't be affecting everything. But he has demons that are. He does have demons that are, that are in their midst. That's why scripture tells us we're not wrestling flesh and blood. We think we are wrestling flesh and blood. We think we are. We think our biggest problem is going to be Christmas dinner when Uncle Fred is there and he's going to start ranting and raving about politics and whatever. And we think, oh, i got to go deal with Uncle Fred. You know? Or we think our biggest problem is, you know, our son-in-law or our daughter's new boyfriend or look what they're doing. We think that that's our biggest problem. But our biggest problem is not flesh and blood. 
Our biggest problem is principalities and powers. That's what we're fighting. Because there's a demonic force, angels that fell from heaven with Lucifer. Scripture gives us every indication that probably a third of the angels in heaven, under the authority of Lucifer, fell with him. Now there's demonic activity. There are angels. Bible talks about that. We can do a whole study on that. I think I did one week on that, but we could do a lot more on angels. But there are with that demonic activity, and we're going to see that in Scripture a couple different times. Let's see what demons did do. Uh, I have several verses marked. Let's start in Matthew. All these are in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, verse 23. Jesus is just getting into his ministry. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went about, about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He was healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. His fame went throughout all Syria. They brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, those which were lunatic, or they had a psychiatric issue, those who had the palsy, and he healed them. Didn't seem to differentiate there, those that were sick physically, those that were sick with some emotional or mental issue, and those that were tormented and possessed, the Bible says the word possessed, that were possessed with devils or demons. There's only one there's only one devil. Bible talks about multiple devils, small d there. That's demons. That's a demon possession that's talking about. And Jesus cast out or removed demons that were possessing people and leading them to do or act in demonic activity. I don't think we see as much of that in the United States, at least so far, as other countries do, from what I understand. Um, um, but did you ever deal with anybody demon-possessed? <laughs> I, I think if you've ever seen it or dealt with it or been near it, you know it. You know it. There's something different about it. Uh, I'm 21, 22 years old. I'm, I'm newly married. Um, and... Um, I'm a Sunday school teacher at my dad's church. And dad asked me to go with him one night. Dad says, I'm going to meet a family in the church. They had been coming to our church for a while. They were very concerned about their son. Their son was invo involved in the occult, at least, at least playing around with it. And uh, dad said, I'm not going by myself. You go with me. <laughs> Okay, I got drafted that night. Let's put it that way. I don't think anybody else really wanted to go. And I, I knew the family. I knew them pretty well. And so um, uh, the young man was probably 15, 16 years old, somewhere around there. He had gotten in a lot of trouble. You know, this was a guy who, you know, I, I, and this, was, this was 30 years ago. Um, it's about the time this book was written, early 90s. And, uh, you know, he had the black fingernails, the real long hair. His room was painted black. You know, the loud music. All that was there, at least so on the surface, you're dealing with some of that. Um, we went over. We talked to the family, the mom and dad, for a while. Because this is usually how it is with a pastor, all right? Mom and dad wanted us to come. The kid didn't want us to come, right? Mom and dad wanted us to come. They were very concerned. The kid didn't want anything to do with us, you know. Uh, he had been to church maybe a couple times, but not regularly and not, not, didn't want to be there. And so we went, we talked to mom and dad for a while. They finally got the young man to come out. He talked with us, and by talking with us, I mean he sat on the couch with his arms crossed, tried not to look at us and grunted at us a few times, you know. Um, that, I, I don't know, and I'm being honest with you, I don't, I don't know that he was necessarily demon-possessed. I think he was messing around with the wrong stuff at that time of his life. About a year before that, I did not go on this one. My dad went to see someone, 
And uh, that's one, whereas dad was talking to this gentleman in his living room, this guy was making guttural sounds. There was a foul odor. There was all kinds of things that led to a real understanding that this guy was seriously demon possessed. And I, we did talk to this young guy. I've kind of kept tabs, tabs on him through the years. Um, he seems to be doing pretty good. I don't know that he's a Christian, but he certainly doesn't seem to be involved in any satanic activity anymore. And so, um, but the, the one guy that my dad talked to that night, um, I'm not going to say, I don't think dad ever said that, you know, the demons were removed, but dad was there trying, talking to him, praying, um, but the demons were fighting because demons fight to stay in someone when they are possessed with demons. They don't want to leave. We'll see that in some of the biblical passages as well. So I want to give that little bit of a, of a background. Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Jesus begins to answer the Pharisees in verse 39. I'm going to jump down to verse 45, just because of time. Verse 45, Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation." And so Jesus was talking about that demon possession and the effect of demons upon someone. Let's move on. Luke, yeah, let's go to Luke chapter 8. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, and uh, we'll look at some of these other verses next week. In fact, let me mark what we looked at this week. Luke chapter 8. This one we have... Um, read before. And I just uh, looked at this not too long ago. Verse 26, Luke 8, 26. They arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. They went forth to land. There met him out of the city, a certain man, which had devils a long time. He wore no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. So let's look at this guy's reaction. First of all, he's living an, an obscene life. He's running around in nakedness. He's running around as a wild man. He's not living in a home like a normal average person. He's dwelling in tombs. So you can see the effect of demon possession upon him. Number two, we see the demons address Jesus Christ. They know who he is. Um, you know, we talk about people, and this, you know, it um, seems to be popular today to tell people you're an atheist. They don't believe in God. The demons believe in God. Demons know who he is. And so they said to Jesus, look, think of all the people coming to Jesus. We just read about this. He starts his ministry and people are bringing multitudes of people to Jesus because they're sick. They have psychiatric issues. They have health issues. They have de demonic issues. They're bringing people to Jesus to find help. This demonic man, the demon speaking through him, meets Jesus at the edge of the sea when he lands and says, I beseech thee, torment me not. Notice the reaction. Notice what he's asking. Verse 29, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oft times it had caught him and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness was absolutely destroying him physically. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? Uh, by the way, we know this. We, you can read ahead there. What, who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to the demons in this man, right? Because he said, Legion. 
because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. There was a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. They besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man, entered into the swine. The herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choke, or choked, or they were, they were drowned as they entered into the swine. Just a couple thoughts, and there's so many things we could get into in this passage, and time is, is very much slipping away on us. But the demons didn't want Jesus to cast them into the deep. Well, I don't know what all that means. Perhaps into hell or off of the earth or into the depths of the sea right there. But whatever, they didn't want to go there. They wanted to go from one living being, this man, into another living being, pigs. So they could take up residence in these swine. They were able to, and Jesus let him go into the swine. But what I find interesting is that the swine, listen, the swine had enough sense when they were possessed by devils to drown themselves. What a miserable state the pigs found themselves in, right? They were, so, they were so overcome by the possession of devils that they took their life. They drowned themselves in the sea. Just to think about what it means when something is demon-possessed. We're going to get into more of this next week. There's so much more. I have pages of notes here yet. Um, uh, real quick, we're going to talk about this. A Christian cannot be demon-possessed. A Christian can be demon-oppressed. Demons like to bring temptation. They want to see us fall into sin. I wrote these down. I think this will be the emphasis next week. What do, what is demon, what do demons use to trip us up? I wrote down a list, and I've added to it, and I think we'll continue to add to it. They use temptation. They use doubt. How many times in the Old Testament tell us the nation of Israel were, were punished by God because of unbelief? Unbel they, we, they, demons will use doubt. They will use guilt of what I did, who I was. They will use fear. They will use confusion. They will use illness. We'll talk about the power that God has to allow them to affect us. But listen, demons may not be able to make us sick and certainly cannot without God allowing them. But they know when we are sick and like to attack us when we're down, right? That's what we're going to talk about. They'll use envy. They'll use pride. I've talked about the fact I think pride's the foundation of all of this. They'll use slander. They'll use, I added this one today. They'll use being offended or hurt. I talked, I've been talking to someone this past week who's offended or hurt. Well, I can't believe that that's what people think of me. Can I be blunt? I, I, I have not said this to this person yet, but I, I want to. This is not somebody, obviously, that's here. People don't think that much about you. We have this wild idea that people spend every waking moment thinking about me, you know, and they don't. <laughs> Nobody's thinking about you, you know. We got enough of our own stuff to think about. But it's not, but we get so easily hurt and offended. And when we get offended, we go towards sin. We go towards leaving our ministry, leaving church, walking away. All those things, the demons love to use that stuff to affect us. This is the strategy of Satan in trying to get us. The last thing we're going to talk about, and I think this is important. I believe the Bible doesn't give us any indication that demons can reside in um, non-living uh, 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 beings or things. In other words, 
I put zero credence in a haunted house. No credence in a haunted house, right? Demons are not possessing an old abandoned house. They possess living things. It looks like from scripture, we have every indication. We'll talk about that next week too. If you want to know what I'm, what I'm looking at in my notes in the weeks ahead, those would be the things that I think we should talk about. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll let you go. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we've had tonight. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we want to know, we want to know our enemy. And Lord, we want to know how to defend ourselves against the enemy. Lord, you've given us every tool. We have everything we need. Lord, may we understand the enemy, the strategy, what they try to do, what they try to use. Satan wants us defeated Christians, not victorious Christians, defeated Christians. He wants us shipwrecked. He wants us without hope. He wants us to give up. That would be his ultimate strategy. Lord, he's not attacking the world. He has them. He's attacking believers. Lord, may we be, may we be um, on guard. Uh, may we be uh, uh, wise in how it is Satan and his demonic activity is trying to afflict mankind. Lord, we thank you. Guide our steps as we leave here tonight. Lord, we ask all this in your precious name. Amen.